Hello and welcome to this discussion on leadership and how we can be effective change makers. We are so excited to be gathered here with all of you because we feel that this is such an important topic that has the potential to shape our futures and the future of the planet. So thank you to each and every one of you for being here to explore how we can create greater impact and greater change as we strive for environmental justice. The Resurgence Trust and our co-hosts, Eco Resolution, hope that you'll leave here feeling inspired, renewed, and better equipped to create change. Here to share their journeys and insights, we are joined by a panel of luminaries, each of whom are creating an incredible impact through the work they are doing. So with great thanks and excitement, we welcome Noga Levy Rappaport, Lila June Johnson, KMT Freedom Teacher, and Salvador Gomez Colon. We're very excited to hear their thoughts on the leadership that is needed in the world at this time of climate crisis. But before we do, we would like to give this event a bit of context and tell you very briefly about the two organizations that have come together to host this discussion. My name is Georgie and I work for the Resurgence Trust, which is an educational charity for social and environmental justice. We're very grateful for any donations that you may have made to the Trust when registering to this event. Resurgence seeks to contribute to a harmonious future for people and planet through a broad range of events such as this and our solution focused trailblazing publications that are read around the world and have been leading voices at the forefront of the environmental movement since the 60s. We publish Resurgence and Ecologist, a print or digital bi-monthly magazine that explores social environmental justice, activism, politics, economics, ethical living and the arts. It's a holistic and hope inspiring read. We also publish The Ecologist, which brings you free daily online environmental news. Ever ahead of its time, The Ecologist has played a crucial role in diagnosing the crises that have become all too apparent today and is considered essential reading by many of those seeking to bring about climate justice. We're honored to have the editors of The Ecologist responding to your comments in the chat today and engaging with you in discussion there. Hello everyone, um, thank you Georgie. My name's Christabel Reed, and I'm one of the co-founders of Eco Resolution, an environmental justice platform that enables people to step up rather than shut down in the face of the ecological crisis through education, community building, and a big picture approach to change. Um, we're part of the new charity, Initiative Earth, which very excitingly got officially registered today. Um, and it's a great honor to be here um, and to be facilitating today's discussion. The Resurgence Trust has been instrumental in my life and each of the panelists with us this evening are also a huge inspiration. Um, so thank you very much. Great, thank you, Christopher. Um, we will quickly outline um, this event's schedule for you. It's a two hour event that will wrap up by 9 p.m. UK time and will be recorded for those that cannot join us live. Each of our panelists will speak for 15 minutes and then we'll take a few moments to gather your thoughts on what skills are needed for effective leadership and change making via the poll and chat function. The Resurgence Trust will then use your feedback to provide events that can support you in creating a greater impact. After collecting your thoughts and feedback, we'll move on to a 30, 40 minute Q&A. Please submit any quest questions you have for the panelists using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens and state whether your questions are for all the panelists or for individuals. Finally, please avoid using the chat box for questions to the panelists, but do let us know your thoughts. Make sure to set your chat to message all panelists and attendees to be part of this discussion today. Now, with great pleasure, I will introduce our first panelist, the incredible Lila June Johnson. 
Laila June is an Indigenous environmental scientist, doctoral student, educator, community organizer, and musician of Diné, Tetejes de Heste, and European lineages from Taos, New Mexico. Laila's internationally acclaimed performances and talks combine hip hop, poetry, acoustic music, and prayer that invigorate and inspire audiences across the globe towards personal, collective, and ecological healing. Her messages focus on the environmental crisis, indigenous rights, supporting youth, intercultural healing, historical trauma, and traditional land stewardship practices. Thank you so much, Laila. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really grateful to all of the organizers of Resurgence for taking so much time and effort. And I'm thankful to all of the participants that are here uh, thank you so much for giving me a little time to share and thank you to my co-panelists. I'm really excited to hear what you have to share. I'll introduce myself in my traditional language first, just to honor my ancestors, and then I'll move into my, my thoughts on the subject. So, um, that means greetings my kin and my family uh, and my people because in our language, all people are my people. Um, I'm from the Black Charcoal Street Division of the Red Running Into Water Clan of the Diné Nation. We are also incorrectly known as Navajo sometimes. Uh, my father's mothers of the Cheyenne Clan or Tsetse, um, my mother's father is from the Salt Clan of the Diné. My father's father is of the European clans, as far as I know. Taos, New Mexico, In that manner, I introduce myself uh, as a Diné woman, and I hail from Taos, New Mexico. Really honored to be here. Um, yeah, as they mentioned, I'm a doctoral student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, focusing on the intersection of indigenous food systems and indigenous land management. And it's just such a beautiful intersection to explore, just to see how beautiful and complex and advanced Native American food systems were and still are, and how they're, they have affected the whole earth and they're continuing to affect the whole earth. About 70% of the foods we eat today are from varieties from the Americas. Um, so I'm also a musician and a poet. Um, I can't seem to stop making art. Um, so I just kind of do whatever I want to do, depending on the day. Uh, I also ran for office earlier this year uh, in the state of New Mexico against the Speaker of the House. Uh, it was quite a doozy. Uh, <laughs> learned a lot. Um, went up against the oil and gas industry and they, they slammed me down pretty good because I was a, a viable threat and I was uh, electable. So it got pretty ugly, um, but I learned a lot. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and my work. Um, I also founded a children's festival in 2011, which is really about trying to prevent youth suicide. So I've had a lot of sort of experiments in leadership and experiments in trying to make change in the world. Um, I also was sort of like a citizen journalist at Standing Rock and really trying to report out to the world, you know, what we were going through there when we were trying to protect the water from the Dakota Access Pipeline. So I just wanted to share what I've learned through these various uh, iterations of leadership and these various experiments. Um, you know, funnily enough, I think the answer is to every question is, is love. I think that love is what creates the most beautiful change, the most long lasting change, the most constructive change. Um, and that love is ultimately the force that, that is always gonna be the most highest. And um, to operate from love uh, at every turn, love for our people, love for our struggle, love for our enemy, love for our planet, love in every step we take and every breath we take. Um, and so what that means a lot in, in the process of change making for me 
is that uh, it's, it's, it's more about the process than the outcome. For my elders, what they taught me is it's the way you fight. That's where your victory lies, not necessarily in the outcome of the fight. And so for instance, at Standing Rock, we never lifted a weapon. We never, uh, uh, we were praying for the helicopters that were flying over us every day. We were praying for the police that were putting us in dog cages. We were praying for the water. We were bringing the whole world together. We were uniting things that had never been united before. Uh, all of the US Army veterans came to support us. The Christian clergy came to support us. And those are two things Native Americans haven't always gotten along with. <laughs> and so we were uniting the world and we were inspiring indigenous peoples around the world to stand up for, for something that they believed in. Um, but, you know, the pipe did go in the ground. Um, at the end of the day, um, the former president uh, actually um, did an executive order and streamlined the Dakota Access Pipeline illegally. Found uh, The judge found it to be an actual illegal construction. Uh, so you could say we lost the battle, right? That the pipeline went in and we lost. But my elders say we won, that we were victorious in that fight because the way we fought was beautiful, was courageous, was loving, was prayerful, was full of faith, full of truth. And even though we might have lost that battle of the pipeline, we won the war of, of really inspiring the world and changing the way people think about water. Now people don't just take a shower and they drink some water that they, you know, mini which Tony means water is life. And so we really um, brought that really strongly into the consciousness of the world. And thousands of people came, you know, at one point there was 5,000 people at the camp and every single person I've ever talked to who came into the camp left with a lot of inspiration and had their lives changed. And so if nothing else, you know, we touched the lives of so many people, um, not just those 5,000 that were there that day, but all of the many, many more thousands who had come in and out over the, the span of the struggle. And so that love was palpable. It was potent. I mean, it was everywhere. Everyone came to give their gift to this movement. And so I think ultimately love is going to be our greatest tool as change makers. Um, even the term change maker, you know, we, we built into that is this assumption that if we don't make the change, then we failed. But I think, again, the way we fight is just as important as the outcome of the fight. And we declared victory at Standing Rock. Um, I think another thing that really helps in leadership and in change making is having the audacity to build things that have never been seen before and to chart an unlit path. Uh, that's really hard sometimes because we suffer, as Einstein said, from a atrophy of imagination. Um, but what you can see in your heart, you know, there's those visionaries out there who see something and it just looks a lot better than what we have. And even though it shouldn't be possible, they still try. Um, one example is a good friend of mine who founded a uh, completely um, only speaking the indigenous language at an at a eco-village. And so it's a language immersion eco-village. And I went and visited the other day and it was so beautiful because everywhere I walked, I heard the Muscogee language being spoken by the children, by the elders, by the parents, by the teenagers. Um, we ate food that we harvested from all around. Uh, they were creating tiny houses that had geothermal heating, uh, annualized geothermal inertia. Um, they had the T, the T post framing or T framing so that there was no nails. It was all wooden pegs. All of the wood was harvested from the 700 acres that this eco village lives on. Um, 
and they were really teaching people the different ways that their people walk on the earth. Uh, everything from as we're making these uh, these gluten-free non-diabetes pancakes because native peoples we have diabetes epidemic, and we're putting that batter into the uh, into the into the pan to make the pancake. He said, you know, get all of it out, get all of it out of the bowl. You know, we don't waste. That's that's not our way. We use everything, and something as simple as that. You know, that whole 700 acres provides the classroom to teach little lessons like that that help us understand the ancestral way of living here. So if you talk to him and said, hey, you're a Native American, do you think it's possible to buy 700 acres, to raise enough money to buy 700 acres and create an alcohol-free, a uh, soda-free, uh, negativity-free, bad, bad vibes-free, you know, eco village where we only speak the Muscogee language, you know, most people would be like, no, nah, that's not possible. <laughs> you know? But he has this strange um, belief that he doesn't really care if other people say it's impossible. And he just pushed forward. And they're doing things they've never done before. So I think as as leaders and as change makers, I think we need to work on and address that fear that we feel of either not being adequate to do a task we've never done, not being knowledgeable enough to do a task we've never done. Um, and this fear that, that because it's so new, it's just not worth trying. I think we need to tackle that head on and, and just go for it. What you see in your heart, just do it, you know, just, just go for it. Like, and at the very least, you know, you will fail and learn so much that will help you in your uh, next iteration of your experimentation. And so I think it's really important to charge through that unlit path, make those mistakes, learn, um, and, and just, just do what our wildest dreams are asking us to do. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying. And I think his eco village really showed me and reminded me why I'm doing what I'm doing, which is um, creating a university that is dedicated to traditional indigenous knowledge. You know, all of the schools in the whole country have destroyed Native American knowledge. The boarding schools has ripped us apart and made our languages bad. But, you know, what if we had a school that uplifted this knowledge, supported and guided students in recovering this knowledge and implementing this knowledge and embodying this knowledge. And so I think the big question we must ask ourselves as change makers is why not, you know, why not do it? And sometimes the world isn't ready for our big ideas, but sometimes they are. And sometimes at least posing that idea helps them see where, what's possible and where we can go. So that's what I would say to everyone is just, you know, honor your imagination as sacred. Honor the, the dreams and the visions in your heart as sacred. Remember that creator gave you this passion and this inspiration for a reason and to really believe in it and trust it, even though you can't quite see where it's leading you. That's what faith is right it's continuing to step forward when the path is not lit and so as my elders said you know truth faith and love they said those are your weapons in this battle and that's all the weapons that you'll need so i'm not an expert at that i don't claim to be but at least i know my goalposts: truth faith and love and bringing those forward into into the earth and lastly but not least because i'm running out of time here i would say don't forget to have fun. Don't forget to have joy. Don't forget to savor life. Because I know we work hard, we take care of everyone else, but don't forget to take care of yourself, love yourself, uh, give yourself a perfect day every now and then, whatever that means to you. And, and don't forget that we're here to have good lives for ourselves as well. 
So with that, I will pass it on to the next wonderful panelists. I'm so grateful to be working with, with you three. I'm excited to hear what you have to say and I appreciate all of your time and attention. Thank you so much, Lila June. That was so, so beautiful and moving. Um, I'm so grateful for the incredible insights you shared and I can't wait to hear more from you um, in the Q&A. Um, please be sure to jot down any questions you have for Lila, um, Lila June, and we will answer them once all of the speakers have spoken. Our next speaker is Salvador Gomez Colon. Salvador is a 17 year old climate resilience and youth empowerment advocate who shares a vision of hope for a more sustainable, cohesive and inclusive future where young people have a seat at the table. Salvador has led several disaster relief missions and spoke alongside Greta Thunberg for the World Economic Forum as one of the 10 teenage change makers at the annual meeting earlier this year. He's received the President's Environmental Youth Award and the Diana Award for his socio-humanitarian work. And we are honored to be joined by Salvador today. Thank you for being here. Great, thank you, Georgie, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Lala June, for an amazing message that preceded me. Three years ago in 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated my home island of Puerto Rico. The surrounding destruction disconcerted me and the thought of staying passive in the face of this new harsh reality made me feel ill at ease. I wanted to harness my empathy and give hope to those in despair. But at first I was unsure of what I could do. I was just a 15 year old high school freshman who had just turned 15 two weeks prior. But I took the time to observe and recognize people's needs and two things stuck out. The absence of power and the lack of clean clothing. When I brought to my mom the idea of providing light and dignity as a response to the hurricane, she left me with the following words. Salvador Gabriel, that's my full name. If you start this, you have to take this to the end. From that moment, the pressure was on. I ventured to launch Light and Hope for Puerto Rico, an initiative to raise $100,000 to purchase solar lamps and hand crank washing machines to distribute to a community in the coastal municipality of Loiza, a town that had been devastated by both hurricanes Irma and Maria. After visiting Loiza and witnessing the outright neglect that this community was experiencing, I came to the unsettling realization that this desperation must plague communities well beyond it. So I vowed not to limit any impact to this township alone. After nearly a year, I had raised close to $200,000 and reached thousands of families across 18 of the island's municipalities. Since then, I've continued to lead and organize community focused disaster relief initiatives across the world, including the Bahamas and Puerto Rico, and have had the privilege of sharing parts of my story and perspective as I'm doing with you all today. My conviction to ensure light and hope success stem from two main pillars. The first one is always easy to describe. I didn't want to disappoint my mom. The second takes a bit more explanation. Since I was much younger, I've carried a profound drive to help others and be an agent of change. And before the hurricane, I'd participated actively in community engagement programs, both through school and outside of it. And I'd always looked out for the well-being of those around me. But after Hurricane Maria hit, I realized that the need for action had never been greater which compelled me to act in a way that I had never done before. I could not stand by while thousands of people were in dire need of help. And I believed in something better, the possibility of living on an island where suffering imposed by lack of attention did not exist. And I knew that the only way to make this happen was to get myself involved. There are many ideas in this world, but not enough people are taking action on them. And there's nothing more important in today's world than standing up when you feel something is wrong. There's nothing more important than having hope having a dream and taking action on it. Because dreams give us a vision of the future that we want for our world, leaders are who get us there. Those who have the audacity to want a better future and take action for it. We are at a convergence point in our human history where the challenges we face are monumental and our societal fabrics are unraveling and we're often failing to keep up. It is no surprise that there are those who evade responsibility from these brutish challenges. But for posterity's sake and our sake, we need to respect this moral imperative and value courage over cowardice. These are political challenges, social challenges, and environmental challenges of unprecedented natures that demand the world's attention. And it goes without saying that when I mention the word world, I mean everyone of all nationalities, of all races, of all creeds, and of all ages. Because to solve the challenges we face as a globe, 
we need all hands on deck. And we, today's youth, will have a remarkable role to play in solving these human challenges. There's something about our generation that strikes me, it's something different. We see where society is falling short and feel the urge to prevent our world from falling into that abyss. Some may call us idealistic and say that our vision for the world is impractical or dare they say impossible. But idealism gives us something to which we can aspire. It's our North Star. And aspiration for a goal, no matter how daunting, is what gives humanity value. There's this common misconception that still goes around that to be a leader, you need a position of authority or a position of power. And in our context as young people and possibly students, that's creating an organization, becoming the figurehead of a movement or being president of your school, the list goes on. But that isn't the only way to be a leader because a leadership role doesn't make you a leader. It's how you treat your responsibility that does. That's why we see many people of all ages who fail to respect their duty and as such are ineffective leaders. And simultaneously, we see people who don't hold particular positions, but use their voices to affect meaningful change. They embrace their role within their communities or create a community and do their best to push it forward, to uplift it and empower it. When one is a leader, fostering collaboration is imperative because to drive positive change and make an impact, you cannot work alone. Many of the challenges we face as a society result from the reawakenings of individualism and isolationism. The idea is that as countries, as peoples, as community members, we don't need anyone else. But this thinking could not be farther from the truth. In such an interconnected and globalized world, like the one in which we live, the challenges one edge of the world faces have impacts on all others. The most pressing problems we face today, like the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis, growing social inequities, and economic disparities are all human challenges that require collaboration to reach concrete and definite solutions. When we see the global tides shifting into this detachment from the rest of the world, we should not conform. We can ask for better and we can act for better. Here's where young people come in. As the future and present of our world, of humanity, we are morally obliged to start setting the course for the world we want for ourselves, for our children, and for seven generations ahead. This realization may seem intimidating to some of you. I know that when I first came to this conclusion, it loomed over me too. But we all need to find our calling find our purpose. You may ask yourself as I did, how do I find my purpose? Now, I'm clearly not here to give you professional advice. I am still a high school student, but a purpose is much more than a job. It's an ethos, a guiding mission, a set of values. A dear friend gave me the idea during the summer of creating a personal mission statement for myself as, as he had. When he brought the idea to me, I was shocked because I noticed that after three years of engaging in humanitarian work, speaking across the world and writing fervently about the future I seek to build, I never set out to establish my most cherished values. Light and Hope for Puerto Rico had a clear mission, you know, provide solar lamps and hand crank washing machines to the most impacted communities around the island. But that wasn't personal. That was merely the mission of my initiative. A personal mission statement answers the question, why? Why am I moved to do what I do? In my case, why did I create Light and Hope? So in honor of my friend, and so you all have a better understanding of my guiding values, here is my mission statement, which I keep written on an index card on my bedside table. I aim to use my experiences, education, and privileges to support my mission of creating a more sustainable, cohesive, and inclusive future where human dignity is valued and advanced. I will always be a community builder who inspires and empowers those around him. My mission statement, my purpose, is informed by my experiences, hopes, and fears as should yours. Having been at ground zero of the major natural disaster that was Hurricane Maria, I encountered countless people whose realities rattled my core. The teenage avid reader who could not seek refuge in a book at night because she had no power. The elderly widow who risked getting burned by kerosene so that she could see at night. The diabetic man who was slowly passing away because he cannot receive dialysis. Witnessing the hurricane's impact burst the bubble of my naivete. And I realized that I had to see the realities on the ground to affect positive change. These are the experiences that inform my mission. Consequently, these realities are what build my hopes, would give me aspirations. I explicitly reference these hopes in my statement, my wanting a future that is more, quote, sustainable, cohesive, and inclusive, where human dignity is valued and advanced. These hopes are direct responses to my fears of where our world may be headed, a world with environmental catastrophes, unbridled economic inequality, and intransigent isolationism. My hopes are as magnanimous as my fears are menacing. 
And this reality continues to drive me to take action. And I'm confident that they will help you too. Once you establish your personal mission, you have stepped foot on the first cobblestone on the path to becoming a change maker. You don't need to wait for external validation to gain confidence in yourself. If you believe in your purpose, you shall gain the self-assurance to get going. Doing this means laying out your specific priorities, reaching out to your potential contacts and persisting amidst all the obstacles you face. Throughout your journey, you must engage others in your change making mission and mobilize them into action. Your passion and sincerity will speak to who you are and inspire those around you to join your fight because a good leader gets results, but a great leader inspires those around them. A great leader puts themselves and their ego aside and focuses on setting an example to others. But taking care of oneself is also a significant part of setting that example. It's okay to be working for hours on end, preparing an action plan or making phone calls or having meetings, but only if you also take the time to wind down, read, watch movies or TV, go outside, whatever else you may want to do, because a leader needs to be well to work. And I say this from personal experience, it's easy to fall into the spiral of focusing wholly on the task at hand or the issue you care about, which for many of us is our environment, our future and forget to detach sometimes. A topic like the climate crisis is not easy to bear and it's easy to burn out when dealing with it. None of us are human suits. None of us are superhumans. We all have our biological limits. So do not ignore your feelings. Only when we are fully charged and at our best are we ready to traverse today's leadership and social structures, engage those around us and affect change at all levels. It's expected that the systems in place right now may also cause us frustration as they do to me sometimes. And it's often difficult to affect change because of the hierarchical leadership structures that seem to make things impossible and bureaucratic. But as I mentioned before, a leader's power comes not from a position, but through how they engage others and draw them into their cause. As a leader, you need to bring people in and engage them in your narrative. The best way to do so is to tell a story so compelling that it's impossible to look away. Of course, it doesn't have to be literal, but what I mean is that your values come from somewhere. So embrace that path. Embrace what got you to where you are today. Embrace the issues about which you care and let that lead you in your quest to guide others. When you see or read about an issue facing many people, for example, the climate crisis, it is hard to get those not already involved to feel attached and concerned. And part of this comes from the fact that the narrative about the climate crisis is always focused on data, on big numbers, the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere or the millions of people who will be displaced by rising sea levels or lose food and water supply because of arid conditions. These numbers compel a select few to join the fight. Only those who are already understanding the all underlying implications and are devoted to protecting and advancing others' well beings. When we start talking about individuals, specific people whose lives will be changed forever by these crises, only the apathetic have the heart to ignore. That's why mobilizing empathy is so vital for addressing the climate crisis, harnessing the power of stories to create an understanding that accurately reflects the state of our world today. As a fellow young person, I cannot have more faith in our ability as a generation to come together despite what brings us apart and dare to face the challenges that define today. Only if we are optimistic and willing to dream will we escape the doldrums between our currently untenable world and a more prosperous and just future. So lead on. Thank you so much, Salvador. Um, I love hearing your personal um, story and journey towards mobilizing yourself and your networks. Um, and your overview of, of leadership is so empowering. I love how you spoke about, you know, the importance of, of dreaming and, and a vision. And I think that's something that we, we often forget. And we, when we think of the future, a lot of people will think of something like Mad Max or The Matrix. And it's going to be hard to get out of bed and onto the streets if that's the way that we're envisioning the future. So as much as possible, kind of really holding on to our, our visions of the future because it's unwritten. And um, like you said, it's it's down to, to the people to take it in the best direction towards um, a thriving, uh, thriving world and thriving cultures. Um, can't wait to hear more from you in the Q&A. Um, our next speaker is KMT Freedom Teacher. Um, KMT is an activist who uses hip hop for social awareness and social cohesion, mentoring young people, nurturing their ideas and fueling passions through music and the environment. KMT is the co-founder of the May Project Gardens, an amazing, amazing award-winning um, grassroots project that connects urban communities to nature. 
to themselves and to each other. Um, through community-led food growing spaces, educational programs, hip hop and creative art events, the May Project Garden specializes in outreach to marginalized groups. The nonprofit organization provides practical, affordable and collective solutions to address poverty, disempowerment and self-sustainability. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I think I'll let you just continue to speak because <laughs> you present myself better than I present me. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, here we go, that's what I was after. I wanted to share the screen one second. Um, so the way I'm going to do this, because everyone was so um, beautifully articulate in terms of what they were describing, I'm going to take a slightly different approach if this works. Um, I don't know, I've got two screens. I don't know if you can actually see um, my screen. And if you can, I don't know whether um, you can let me know because I can't, I can't see the chat at the same time. So give me one second. I'll let you know. Can you see the screen? Not yet. Okay, give me one second. Let's try this way around. Okay, can you see the screen now? Not yet, no. I wonder whether um, someone needs to give you permission to via the Zoom. No, it should, um, it should be just sharing the screen, okay. which I've done. Share screen. Okay. Here we go. Can you see it now? Not yet. <gasps> yes, yes. Okay. Great. All right, forgive me for that. So um, yeah, let's, let's, let's dive in. Fly little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. Fly little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. 2005, my mum, Sonia May, passed to the other side. After a lifetime battle with alcohol, diabetes, depression, and doctor-induced drugs, the May Project Gardens is created to celebrate her life. My world, once dark, is now filled with light and inspires others to never give up the fight. 2006, Randy, head gardener, co-founder, plants his feet. He is the heart and soul that inspires the whole May team. Two years later, the once debris garden now grows. Potatoes, grapes, I'm starting to like marrows. Created using permaculture that looks at the land, designing surrounding spaces to give nature a hand. We open to the public two days a week. People learn food growing, starting from seed. Okay, so um, yeah, just to introduce myself. Um, I have to be honest, when I was asked to present, I got in a bit of a, um, I got in a bit of a um, state, which is quite often for me because um, trying to kind of um, present 14 years of work in 15 minutes is, is quite a challenge. And especially when um, you're dealing with almost like a, um, an ecosystem is what I've created, um, an ecosystem for communities. So it doesn't consist of one thing. And I think it's really interesting just by hearing the previous speakers to see how, although we're on the same path of leadership, how different our approaches, even the way we articulate the different things that we both cover. And I think that's really important. Um, so I basically just decided to do something slightly different. So when we talk about leadership, a lot of the work I do, I refer to this notion of a community, an ecosystem of community. And I think one of the crucial things when you're working in this space is that the difficulty in trying to measure it, the difficulty in trying to 
you know, very often, um, you know, for example, if you're looking at from an economic point of view, it's about, you know, the impact measurement. If you're looking at from a media point of view, it's about how big the news report is. But just like a bumblebee, much of the work that we do as leaders is, is unnoticeable. It's not something that's actually seen. It's not something quantifiable. And I put here, grassroots work is hard to measure because it's behind the scenes. It's a cement of society until it's removed, people don't know it's there. And I thought that was important just to kind of contextualize the work we do as leaders because it may seem quiet. <laughs> it might seem quiet, you know, quite abstract in some senses. And then I went on to um, just key words. Um, Previous speakers were talking about love, and I thought that was really beautiful. Um, and here I've just kind of just put some key stuff, not just, you know, just ideas, concepts, and I've related it to specifically um, the way in which I've worked. So if we look at this concept of self-sacrifice, um, for those who don't know, the May Project Gardens, which was described earlier, still operates in my home, which is a council home. That's the equivalent of a social housing in other parts of the world. And for nine of those years, um, there was no funding whatsoever. It was literally hand to mouth. And I think it was really fascinating as an example of how to make a, a system of change without having any finance. And that was because we always put people first and the resource was actually my council house. So that was really important. Again, um, we're talking about communication skills. I think it's really important. Perfect example, Salvador. <laughs> He's ready for the presidency. <laughs> um, you know, I was just like, when I heard him, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I've got to follow this guy. <laughs> and he's half my age. I was like, no. So I think there's many different ways to communicate. And one of the things we do music through and uh, um, is through music you know, creative arts, like using the voice, you know, um, we specifically use a lot of hip hop. And the reason why we use a lot of hip hop is because basically it's the largest, um, it's the largest um, youth movement in the world. I'm not a young person no more, but I was once upon a time. So I still feel like I have a, a, a good insight into how to use that. I'm talking, the next one I'm talking about is negotiation skills. I think it's really important to have this, this tool um, to negotiate and I've put um, Lush. Now it's in a shortcut. Um, this project was literally started in a garden 14 years ago in my garden and we still work from the garden. But in this journey, I've now managed to be asked to secure a contract actually consulting to one of the largest um, um, cosmetics companies called Lush. Um, some of you may be familiar with them. And I know there may be a lot of kind of concerns with a lot of corporate companies and, um, you know, um, in terms of their ethics. But I really feel like Lush is a really good example of a company trying to make the world a better. And what I like about them is that they try to source their products ethically using permaculture principles. And what's nice about that is how we've designed the garden and the project is also using permaculture. Um, consistency. I think this is really important as a leader, you know, to be consistent in what your message is, what you believe, you know, if it's love, be consistent in love. If it's compassion, be consistent in compassion. You know, someone said in the chat, how do you, how do you respond to adversity? Well, this is how you respond to adversity by being consistent in terms of, you know, your response to things. I think one thing, I think both the previous panel panelists would agree is that, there is always going to be more challenges. Um, they don't. They don't get easier. I don't think. I think they become harder as you become more experienced. But your response to it has to be consistent, and the way you manage it has to be consistent. I think having a lived experience is really important. So I think it's really important that leaders um, have the ability to kind of. Um, have a lived experience by the people that they want to lead as well. This is not always the case, but I think it's very important. So here I've just listed, for example, race, class, economics. It's not to say it's exclusive, but I think it's a really important part of leadership because there's a kind of a, uh, an understanding um, that's really important. I think leading by example is really important. So for example, um, people were talking about um, you know, when I first started wanting to use hip hop, 
I approached a lot of artists to support my project, you know, based on my project is it can re recollects people to nature through food um, and nature. And I asked a lot of artists, oh, could you, could you, could you support my project? You know, um, and they're like, what, rap about food? You're having a laugh, you're, you're crazy. Well, you're gonna rap about food, like, you know? So I had to step up into that realm. And I don't think personally, even to this day, I'm one of the best artists. That's not important for me. I've just led um, this kind of movement in the UK, particularly in Europe, using hip hop and environmentalism as well. So that's really important. Compassion, very important. You know, being a leader, people very often expect to have instant results. And sometimes when you're compassionate, it just takes time. You know, it takes time. Not just compassion for the people you're working with, compassion for yourself as well. Embracing feedback, I think this is really important. And the, one of the ways in which I embrace feedback is by actually listening to nature, um, looking at my environment. What does my environment tell me? What does it reflect? What does it say? Also, the people around me, who's not at a table? Who's not, who's not speaking? Who's not being heard? Who's not in a part of our movement as well? Um, ability to see the whole picture, listening, taking losses. I think that's a really important one. Um, this journey is, you know, is, is when you're a leader, leader, sometimes you have to think of the bigger picture. And sometimes that means taking a loss. Patience and conflict resolution. Um, so those are just a couple of things that I've um, identified. And here I just want to give you examples of the ways in which I've, what I've talked about manifests itself. So here we go. District National Park. What gets me vexed? Give the mother nature. But no respect. Beautiful, gorgeous, sunny day. Out with my friends, we're gonna play. L I double T E R. L I double T E R. L I double T E R. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. L I double T E R. Okay, I just got to cut that short because I know time is short and I want to just whiz through um, some other bits and pieces as well. So I talked about May Project Gardens. That, for example, is my art. Um, I was very passionate about the impact on litter in the environment. And it took me two years before someone actually commissioned me to actually go and do this, um, perform this track in a participatory form. But what was amazing when we did it, the guy that was filming was like, did you plan this? Did you plan this day? Because everyone was so involved, everyone was so organized, everyone was so, you know, passionate about it, even to the point where one young boy, when I performed the track, he ran back and got his dog poo, do you know what I mean? And put it in the bin. Another young woman was actually climbing, scrambling the hills, picking up all the rubbish. It was a phenomenal weekend. But that, when I was talking about all the things previously, it took two years to get together. So when you're a leader, sometimes it can be quite a an isolated journey, but you have to be consistent in terms of your belief and, you know, talk about imaginary in the future as well. So May Project Gardens, as I mentioned, is, is my project that basically runs from my home. Um, and what we do is reconnect urban communities with nature for personal and economic transformation. As you can see in the background, now a lot of people wanted to talk about practical steps. And I know when we talk about climate change, sometimes it's very difficult to kind of imagine what we can do. So this is a garden that was a debris garden, which I mentioned in the, in, the, um, in the poem. But if you can see now, this garden has a compost system. It has, um, we grow food, which we give away for free. We don't charge it. It has growing beds. It's a hub for many ideas. It's a supporting base for many people as well. It's a safe space as well. We have a polytunnel, which has food. We have a tree house. Presently, we're actually growing, a, um, we're not growing, we're actually building a straw bell house. 
So these are practical steps. I think, you know, what's crucial for me being a leader is actually trying to bring people together to provide for practical solutions so people can experience what the solutions are. That's one of the crucial things that I do with Maple Deck Gardens as well. Um, out of this came the youth program. So as I said before, um, like um, Salvador, I'm very passionate, you know, it's about a legacy. As we become old and gray, you know, what's the effects of the, of, of, you know, the next generation, what's the impact, you know, and it's gonna affect them more than us. So this is what I'm very passionate about. I created a youth program called Hip Hop Garden and it actually won an award, uh, won quite a few awards. I'll just play this very quickly. By the well. side of it, you know it's grown, it's swelled, so it's ready and juicy, ready. nice to eat. Mm. <laughs> Hot like your beats. <laughs> The agony for the neglected. I know through the coldest times we are intertwined. I thought, let me use this home as an example of what could be possible. Combining hip hop, the culture of hip hop, all the elements with gardening to make it more relevant, make it culturally accessible, make it fun, make it engaging. Who am I? I am you in the past and present. I'm looking in the mirror thinking, is that my reflection? I hang relief all the agony for the neglected. And it just helped me in just in a way that I find that people can't in some ways. This project helps me by being able to share our, our crafts and our talents and our, our gifts. And to be able to we make food together, eat food together and create a whole energy field together. There is often this perception that urban life and then maybe a slightly more holistic or healthy natural life have to be in conflict with each other. What we try and do with Hip Hop Garden is show that they can be merged and there can actually be synergy between them. Okay, um, I'm not aware of time, but I'm sure it's coming to... Um, I can't see the screen, so I don't know how long I have left. Got about a minute or two in. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. All right, fantastic. Thank you for that as well. Uh, let's have a look. All right. So, um, yeah, so that's basically what I do. So, um, in essence, with my work, um, I've literally created an ecosystem as well for community. And as I mentioned before, it consists of May product gardens and just to emphasize in terms of people you know this sense of kind of like overwhelming challenge which is climate change or being a leader actually one of the things as, as I mentioned before I think it's been mentioned before is making mistakes you know like it's okay to make mistakes it's really important to make mistakes it's about learning from those mistakes and what I do a lot of the time I try to emulate natural systems um, and what I mean by that is that we use a lot of permaculture. Permaculture is a design system that works in harmony with the land as opposed to against it. And once you connect with nature, you can see a lot of these um, ideas, these ideas or the way in which I work as a leader hasn't come from me. I just come from my connection and actually just tuning into nature. So it's really interesting that Lila was talking about the ancestral, you know, connection. Um, it's really interesting for me that I live in the city, South London, you know, and yet I feel very much when people come to the space, they're like, oh my God, this reminds me of their hometown or their own environment as well. Um, so yeah, if you want more information about the work I do, there's two websites, which I'll put in the web, um, in the chat. Um, they're the number three, kmt.co.uk and mayproject.org as well. And I think that's it for me. Have a beautiful day and thank you for your time. Peace and blessings. Thank you so, so much, Kemti. That was so incredible. Um, your work is so multifaceted and it's so great to hear it summarized like that. Um, although I'd like to hear so, so much more. Um, thank you so much for all you've shared. And um, we're already having loads of great feedback coming in in the chat and questions. So we'll come to them shortly. Um, but for now, with great excitement, I introduce Noga Levy Rappaport. Age 18, Noga is one of the youngest high profile climate protesters in the UK. She led the London Climate Strike March last year and plays an important role within the UK Student Climate Network, where she runs nationwide school in initiatives. Noga has previously presented a BBC Radio 4 programme on the youth strikes. 
she guest edited a special climate change section in The Guardian and confronted corporate leaders at International Petroleum Week last year. She's doing remarkable work to raise awareness of the most pressing issues of our time. And she's also one of the founders of TEA, an amateur youth-led theatre group based in London, dedicated to improving teenagers' well-being through performing arts. Noga, thanks so much for being here. Hiya, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm Noga, I'm 18, and I'm a volunteer and organiser within the UK Student Climate Network, who've been responsible for organising the climate strikes across the UK for the past year and a half or so as part of the Global Youth Strike for Climate campaign under Fridays for Future. We're campaigning not just to decolonize and reshape the education system to accommodate for the political and environmental ramifications of the climate crisis, as well as to enfranchise and empower young people. But most importantly, we're campaigning for a Green New Deal that centers a just transition for those on the front lines of ecological catastrophe, and that directly tackles the structural inequalities that brought about the climate emergency, focusing on the UK's fair share of fighting the climate crisis and its historical responsibility in the battle for real climate justice. One of the most important things to tackle in our work is this misconception that the UK is somehow disconnected from the crisis when it has a historic responsibility in it. Imperialism and colonialism laid the groundwork for the climate crisis and the UK has an abysmal record of extractive, exploitative capitalism and the government, rather than trying to end its search for an ever expanding economy and for continual growth, is instead polluting and pillaging on an appalling scale. We can't expect this government funded by deniers and backed by crooks to act on the climate crisis out of the kindness of their hearts. We have to force this action to take place. And we do that by reclaiming our streets, our power and our voices. The, for this event, you know, I was asked why I think leadership is important. And I want to say firstly that I don't think traditional leadership is important at all. I think, in fact, it's very backwards in many ways. The idea that we have to sit and wait for orders and the delegation of work from a centralized executive leadership that sit at the top of a hierarchy, I think it hinders the progress we can make. By aligning itself with the power structures which brought about the climate crisis, we compromise our own morals and values and we betray our own cause. In prioritizing and mimicking the extractive leech-like hierarchical power structures that prop up our systems of inequity, we dismiss the truth that leadership, justice, accountability, and that better world we're fighting for are all deeply intertwined. In creating an order of who is most important from a grassroots level and upwards, we hinder ourselves from working against the greatly unjust, often immensely imperial and colonial systems of who is more important at a global level. Sorry, let me just check my mic is working. At its root, the climate crisis is a great injustice. It's a war that's waged against the most vulnerable so that the richest can continue to line their pockets. To me, that can never sit right, but the truth about the fossil fuel industry has stayed hidden for so long and we're still, even as climate strikers, only just scraping the surface of public awareness. More than just gaining people's attention as leaders, we have a duty both to engage local communities with sustainable initiatives and to tackle structural obstacles to justice from the bottom up, as well as supporting and engaging those communities that have already started to do so. The coronavirus pandemic and the impending climate crisis have laid bare the faults of our global systems, and they've exposed how unprotected and easily battered we are as a society by economic, political, environmental, and public health catastrophes. The limited talk around necessary green recovery plans and the volatile future ahead of us for many young people in particular means that this is a time of great uncertainty for local communities where tried and tested models of support are having the rug torn out from under them. For climate strikers, this unpredictable time is a real opportunity for us to redefine the ways in which we organize and empower young people and the communities and networks around them. We can ingrain new ways of leadership and newfound confidence and the knowledge that we deserve a seat at the table and young people for generations to come. There is a message from the Global Youth Strike for Climate movement that every young person should know, and it's what needs to be ingrained in young minds from the very beginning that they should never have to ask permission or defer to others in order to make a change and act on what they feel is right. It's a belief that the actions and futures of children rely on, particularly when we're faced with a dire ecological emergency. There's never been a time where it's more imperative that children around the world realize their own strength and take action for their planet. And that starts at home, it starts with our communities, it starts with the support networks around us, it starts with enfranchising the young people around us to fight not just the climate crisis, but 
to empower themselves to collectively reshape our own communities and ensure real change to our society happens securely and from the bottom up. For leadership to be effective, like work, it has to be delegated and spread out across the collective. The importance of regional networks and decentralization has never been clearer when organizing for climate justice through strikes and other demonstrations. Currently, we have over 150 countries registered for monthly or weekly strikes around the world. And whilst we're a generation that actively seeks to break down stereotypes, the archetype of the digital generation is one we neither want to nor can shake free. We've grown from one teenager to a global network in the space of almost two years. And none of this could have been done without grassroots organizers across the global south, without digital work, without the autonomous work of environmental defenders and indigenous organizers on whose giant shoulders climate strikers in the UK are privileged to stand on. Our most notable mobilization to date, the historic 20th of September, saw 350,000 students and adults walk out of workplaces, homes and schools together. And we're proud that that was the largest climate demonstration in British history. Volunteers who help us organize go through our website and are immediately welcomed into our online organizing spaces, joining national and regional groups that focus on funding, press, social media, local coordination, community engagement, arts and graphics, school development, entirely directed through the input of all those involved, while selected coordinators who have no direct hierarchical power over the others are responsible for ensuring communication and collaborations between different groups and organizing weekly updates on behalf of the team. Regional groups tend to have more autonomy in the UK when it comes to the structure of their in-person meetings and what kind of leadership models they utilize. And these structures are always held accountable by the national network to ensure transparency and equitable processes whilst remaining a horizontally organized group. It should be added that originally we weren't structured in this way. At the very beginning of 2019, when we were putting together the first climate strikes in the UK, until about mid-April, the Student Climate Network was run by a very small group of approximately 10 young people who together were known colloquially as the core group and who were responsible for the running of the network. The core was formed out of those who had originally founded the organization and had started to pull the strings for the first climate strikes. But by April, we were growing as an organization nationally so rapidly, and we were organizing the first few global strikes of March 2019, that it was no longer fair nor feasible to attempt to entrench hierarchical structures in order to stay accountable. And in my belief, it had never been truly fair. Hence, myself and two others in the core group have dissolved that we dissolve it and reestablish the network as a totally horizontal organization. And looking back on the difference between the months between January to April and April to 19, I think one of the most important takeaways for me during that time was that the level of burnout we would have experienced of organizing those kind of demonstrations, the stress and pressure in the core group of all of us who were in school would have had to undertake would have been far too great and would have massively crippled our efficiency and success. Organizing horizontally without designating leaders allowed us to pull off the global strike of September 2019. Now, obviously, we have to reshape regional and digital networks as a result of the demands and uncertainty of COVID. And I'd be dishonest if I said I knew what was coming next or how we will be structured. On this, we're very lucky that we remain fluid and flexible and regularly discuss restructuring. And I'm hopeful soon that as we break free of the pandemic, we can keep fighting for that safer, secure future. Because really what we do next could change everything. As the world recovers, we have a chance to reset the clock and build back better than before. We need a new deal that prioritizes people, invests in our health service, creates a robust shockproof economy that's capable of tackling the climate crisis. We have to ensure that we can secure the health and needs of everyone in the UK now and into the future, irrespective of employment or nationality. Our green recovery plan has to be properly funded, ensuring that we can protect ourselves from privatization and be available for everyone. We need to be able to decarbonize our economy in a way that can tackle inequality and can enhance the lives of ordinary people, that we can create thousands of new and well-paid green jobs across the country, investing in people, ensuring that the policies and investments for recovery don't just pop up the profits of big banks and executives of corporations that fuel climate change and inequality. We have to start restructuring public and private finance so that we can redistribute power into the hands of people, workers and communities and support sectors that nourish our society and safeguard our future. Talk of a better world is really exciting and it is powerful, but there are so many young people who are unable to access these kinds of events and spaces where we can learn about the ecological emergency and about its solutions. 
young people who are unable to engage in community leadership, who are unable to connect and collaborate with role models and inspirations. The enfranchisement of young people can't come without urgent reform to our educational system. I think for far too long, the national curriculum has restricted students. It's forced us to concentrate on a truly limited range of subjects rather than actually developing our understanding of the world and where our place is in it. It encroaches on our rights of, as students to view the educational framework as a place of opportunity and development and understanding. We should be encouraged to step out onto the streets rather than solely self-organize, to look at the injustices of the world around us and rise up against it. We can only do so when we're taught in full about the climate crisis as the greatest threat we've ever faced. We have to start with communities, with schools, with local initiatives and with teachers and students receiving adequate funding and economic support to engage each other with new ways of thinking and organising, as well as reorganising communities and rethinking the leadership that takes place in schools. We have to be taught not just about the impact of climate change, but about its roots, as well as the action that can be taken to save our planet. This gruelling focus on rote learning of the curriculum has to end and instead students have to be encouraged to reach out to return to the home of grassroots activism, education. We have to open the door to a system where students are able to understand and start to address the climate crisis and gain the skills and tools needed for effective leadership. I personally think that young people have a natural advantage when it comes to the attributes needed for collective leadership and social movements. I think that our optimism and our naivety is key in a world that's ravaged by hopelessness. We bring this incredible energy and excitement and hope that anyone who's been to a youth organized demonstration can attest to. And I think for many people, for generations downtrodden by capitalism's horrors, that's not an experience you can always rely on. Whereas we're lucky to have not gone through so many crises yet. These surges of emotion and hope, that empathy, that ability to fall in love with the world around us and the people around us, to utilize our digital networks and the endless archive that is social media through which we can share and inspire others. These are all gifts that young people have been blessed with. I think real leadership, both from adults and from other youth, is about allowing each other to see what we have in front of us and what we can someday achieve with it so that those will come after us will never need to question themselves again. Thank you. Noga, thank you so much. I'm always totally blown away um, whenever I hear you speak. It's just such a joy and so, so inspiring. And I'm so um, in awe of all the incredible work you're doing. Um, so thank you so, so much. Um, before we move on to our Q&A and we ask Noga and all of our other panellists and the questions that you've um, been sending in, um, we'd like to hear a little bit more from you, our audience, while our panellists take a moment to grab a cup of tea or a breath of fresh air if they'd like to. Um, and we'll be back with them in about three minutes or so. Um, so through a series of collaborations, the Resurgence Trust would very much like to assist all of you in your leadership and change-making journeys by offering online discussions and workshops that will provide you with skill sharing and development opportunities and that will continue today's conversation and allow us to build on that. So we've drawn up a list of potential areas that could be explored through these events, um, but we'd love to hear from you. Um, please let us know what you think about these proposals using the poll that will appear on your screens now. Um, this list of um, proposed areas um, is very much a living list. We are open to your suggestions. So as well as responding to the poll, please also add to the chat anything that you feel is missing from this list, any facilitators you'd like to work with, and also what you believe is central to good leadership and change making so that we can include that in our plans. We'll endeavor to create events around your suggestions so that this is a kind of co-created program. Um, we'll give you a few moments to do that and once you have you're also welcome to post more questions to the speakers using the Q&A function. We'd love to ask some of them, um, we'd love to ask some questions that are directed at all the speakers so you're very welcome to include them um, and please keep the questions coming as we move into the Q&A.
Um, while you are all filling out the poll, I'd like to introduce you all to the Switch It campaign. Um, sometimes options on how to act on climate change can seem overwhelming um, or intangible um, or long term, but there are really simple and effective ways to make an impact, such as moving your money from a bank which is funding ecological devastation um, and community devastation to one which is building a more stable future. Future. So moving away from, from those which are funding the harmful industries which are creating all, all, um, all the suffering. So you can visit switchit.money to find out how your money is funding fossil fuels and switch banks by Switch It Day, which is the 1st of December. And um, I'm pretty sure Switch It is doing um, these Switch It days every few months. So keep an eye on it. And um, if you do it on the 1st of December, perhaps you can then get your friends or family um, and networks to do the same. Um, I think it's going to be put in the chat as well, the, uh, the, the link to the um, website is the word. <laughs> Fab, thanks, Christabel. Yeah, definitely check out Switch It. Um, we will give you another minute or so to um, respond to the poll. You're obviously welcome to um, click more than just um, one thing on the events that interest you. Um, and there's also, it's a two part thing. We're offering um, a couple of suggestions. So have a nice little scroll. Um, yeah, one more minute there. I've just had a question from um, someone in the audience saying, where is the poll? If you can't see the poll, go along the panel at the bottom of your Zoom and you should see um, the word poll. Um, if you click that, um, you should be able to fill it out there. It's kind of almost like the Q&A function or the chat function kind of thing. Okay, fab. Maybe we could keep the poll for another 30 seconds um, while I kind of begin introducing the um, Q&A. Um, thank you all for filling out the poll or those of you that have already. Um, you're welcome to continue to add your event and facilitator suggestions as well as your thoughts to the chat. We're now going to go on to our 35, 40 minute Q&A session um, where we'll be posing your questions to the panelists. Be sure to keep them coming, particularly any questions that are for every all of the panelists. Um, oh, and I will hand over to Christabel to do that. Thanks, Georgie. Um, so, are all the panelists, um, or they, can we all turn on your videos? Thank you. So yeah, so me and Georgie are going to do alternate questions. Um, and the first one is for all of you. Um, a lot of you have kind of touched on this already, um, but would love to hear more about um, this topic. And if you'd like to speak to this question in particular, just put your hand up so I can um, invite you to un unmute. Um, so the question from the audience is how can change makers and leaders ensure they do not experience burnout when tackling the challenges posed by the environmental crisis? I'll say that again. Um, how can change makers and leaders ensure they do not experience burnout when tackling the challenges posed by the environmental crisis? Uh, Noga. Um, I mean, I think there are two aspects to kind of dealing with burnout and eco anxiety, which I think is the case for like many um, activists, particularly a lot of young people. I think the first step is accepting that this is a terrifying thing that we are up against. This is an ecological catastrophe of the kind we've never faced. And, and, and I think recognizing that can take a massive weight off your shoulders because a lot of those who experience burnout just keep working to the point of exhaustion because we forget that the world does not actually rest on our shoulders and actually we are not solely responsible um, for solving this crisis. I think recognizing that and then building up the support networks around you, ensuring that those you collaborate and work with 
um, recognize that you are in a similar position to them and you need to take a break for yourself. You need to allow for others to take a break and you need to know when to delegate work when it's appropriate. Um, and that it is okay to step back and it is okay to say you know what if I work anymore I'm going to exhaust myself I'm going to drain myself of my own emotional and physical resources and I won't be able to do the actual work I won't be able to do the actual organizing and this will have I will have overworked myself for nothing and I think it's really really important to take those breaks when you need to thought like I'm not saying the climate crisis will wait but there are enough people out there who can take up the work in the meantime whilst you take that moment for yourself thank you Noga would anyone else like to speak to that yeah I think it's really important um to just to re-emphasize the importance of just taking time out for example practical basis I've been doing this a long time 14 years and I work with the most challenging young people not just young but challenging people people with mental health people with disabilities people with trauma and actually the impact on me because I have it in my home so it's much more it's much more intense in terms of the interaction that you're dealing with people like you're dealing with people's like you know a lot of their stuff and one of the things that I had to do more recently is just take a Wednesday off like I don't I don't I just lock off I don't engage with anybody um, because for people who don't know it's my home and a project because I didn't have resources I didn't have money so I basically said okay what can I use I can use my home but it's kind of like it's it's a blessing and a curse because you're so embedded in the project it's really great because people feel safe and comfortable but at the same time to put boundaries and put you know as Noga was saying to say no to put boundaries to kind of take care self-care of yourself that's been a bit more of a challenge for me but now basically you definitely need to install that from the get-go like put those boundaries and put your self-care um, and it's very funny because you're a victim of your own success like for example because um when you become more popular you become more a leader or people look at you more as a leader they want your time more and like for example for me like but earlier on someone was knocking at my door like to borrow some equipment do you know what i mean and that happens all the time and i've just got to go don't knock at this time don't call me at this time da, 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 da. and that almost seems counterintuitive to what you do when you're dealing with care and compassion and love but actually you have to love yourself in order to basically become a true leader. And that's quite a challenging one. Thank you so much. Um, that made me think also of what Lila was saying earlier on about um, the importance of joy. Um, and I think that's something we can really forget about when we're engaging in, in climate action and environmental action. And we become so kind of focused on ensuring that our our actions have the results that we want them to have. Um, and so we're so focused on the future, we're like not able to be in touch with our reality. And if you're not present to what's going on, you can't connect with any kind of pleasure or, or joy or, or presence with your community um, and, and with the natural world. So. Um, I love I, I love the messages that you've shared of self care, finding time, and giving yourself a little space to connect to joy and, and to presence. Um, I'll pass on to Georgie for the next question. Thanks, Chris Phil, and yeah, thank you, KMT. Um, when you email KMT, and if it's a Wednesday, you get a kind of auto response that says it's um, his well being day, and I just think that that is such a incredible thing that um, leaders and members of community need to be modeling to each other. And I think the more that we can kind of start doing that, the more other people will do it. And I really think that that could have a massive um, impact um, if we could all take a bit of time for that um, kind of, uh, you know, looking after ourselves so that we can do more. Okay, so another question um, to those that would like to answer is, how do you encourage and ensure positive intergenerational relationships or conversations about the climate crisis? Um, I need to, uh, we don't, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't able to see that. Who, uh, great, Salvador. Yeah, just to meet yourself, thank you. Of course, I, I think the, the question set, sets up a very important precedent that we need intergenerational collaboration to solve the climate crisis. And surprisingly, I think that it's, it's especially for adults, it's kind of, it's kind of very prevalent to see adults, oh, you know, the young people are taking care of it. Um, and the young people will, 
it'll be fine. Um, and I think that that's wrong on many levels because I, I think not only do young people need adults to be able to make this happen, but adults need young people. And, and here's why I think there's something about youthful idealism, like I mentioned in my remarks, that is so powerful. Um, and I think that as, as you age and as you see more of the world, it it's, it's, seems to be that people lose their idealism. But really, when we challenge ourselves to, to think about doing what seems impossible, that's really where we get places. And the, the question is, yeah, how, how do we encourage people? I think that being frank, being open to conversation, being, you know, reaching out to, to someone who's from another generation saying, you know, I really care about this issue. I have this idea. How can we work together? Um, and, and I think that there's, there's really, there's just, there's this tendency to look at mentorship as, as a hierarchical thing as, as I, you know, you will mentor me or I will mentor you. Um, but I don't think it should be, you know, vertical. It should be more horizontal. The same way we're talking about leadership, because I think everyone learns from each other. I, I love how KMT is going like, yeah, exactly. You know, everyone learns from each other. And I think acknowledging that is really important. Acknowledging what one does know and what doesn't know um, is the first step to really getting somewhere in terms of collaborating through generations to solve the climate crisis. Excellent. Thank you. Has anyone else got something they'd like to add to that? Food, music, <laughs> cook some good food. Like, you know, that's what we did on Sunday. Like literally the, the, the project was meant to be open till 4 p.m. People didn't leave till nine o'clock. Do you know what I mean? Because we just had some good food, some good music, you know, like just it's small things, isn't it? It's like, you know, when we're doing the big things, we've got visions. We have to have that. But just finding those small things that connect us universally food creativity really important you know just you know yeah i think i'll speak on that thank you both um i wanted to offer a, dif a little different perspective to the intergenerational piece is um for us to start thinking you know there's a common native american proverb of to always think about the faces not yet born um, and then when Euro Americans came here, they changed it to always think of the effect of your actions on the next seven generations to come, um, which is beautiful because seven is a sacred number for us, seven stars in the Pleiades. Uh, and so this, the seven has always been a big number for native communities um, across the globe. Um, and so we actually, when I was running for office, I worked with a number of people. Um, and we created the Seven Generations New Deal, which is sort of an indigenous based climate policy. Uh, and that actually, it really focuses on integrating indigenous leadership into our policy frameworks. So I thought this was a really good segue to uh, share that and I'll share it in the chat right now. Uh, the website that outlines the seven point plan. Um, and it's actually, not my idea. I know my picture's on the bottom. I'm trying to take that off because it's not actually my idea. Um, <laughs> it's a, a compilation of a lot of indigenous scientists and Western scientists coming together to create this uh, seven generations new deal. And what I like about it is every single element of it um, allows us to have an actionable item you know the, the the green new deal in the us i, I had a little bit of a struggle with it because there wasn't really any concrete actionable items uh it was more principles and values which is great um but every single point in this seven point plan has an actionable policy shift that we can create um and one of the things we've been talking about is um really uh trying to retrain our brains to think that far into the future, to taste, uh, to plant seeds uh, whose fruit we will never taste. It's hard for our brains to work that way because we're not given that support to think that way when we grow up. But I think that uh, not just Native American and indigenous elders, but around the world, you know, we all used to think that way. We all used to plant forests that we would never enjoy. We always used to uh, uh, prune and clip and take care of landscapes that we would never uh, get to enjoy. And 
and make sure that we kept the herring populations flowing through the seas, make sure we had the deer and the buffalo flowing through the plains and the forests, et cetera. And so I think this policy plan attempts to think in that, in that way. Um, so that's just a little slightly different take on the intergenerational piece. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, that was beautiful. Um, a question again for, for all the panelists is, where is it? Um, how can we effectively engage the existing leadership structures in driving positive and rapid change? Um, yeah, I'll just say that again. How can we effectively engage the existing leadership structures in driving positive and rapid change? Any takers on that one? Um, there's a there's some, an idea we've been thinking about, which is diversity is having a seat at the table. Decolonization is breaking the table apart to start a fire, to make a sweat lodge and bring everybody in. Sweat Lodge is one of our ceremonies. So it's kind of a joke. It's like, do we really want a seat at that table or do we just want to break the table apart altogether? Who does that table serve? Does it serve anyone? Um, so having said that, I did run for office. I did very much engage in the table, the existing established power structure. And I think there are ways, very necessary ways to get in there and make change. I do want to point out, though, that they will always have limitations, uh, which are colonial impositions. Um, for instance, I mean, just two-year terms, four-year terms. That's an interesting idea that that certain people will be elected, and and even just electing people in general. Um, in the old days, the grandmothers used to choose the leaders. They would see, they would watch the, the young men grow up and the young women grow up and they'd see, okay, this, this is who we'd like to have lead. So even the election process is very secular and very, um, it's not consensus based, it's majority takes all. And so it, it, there are limitations built into the existing leadership structure. However, um, you know, here we are, we have, uh, we have this political structure. How are we gonna actually get them to act? Um, one of the first points that, I, that we put in the seven point plan was to get, um, to limit campaign finance uh, for, um, for po politicians or candidates rather, because every single candidate, uh, the candidate I was running against was being funded by uh, oil corporations. So until we break that tie between politics and corporations, in, in America, it's called Citizens United, where they actually allow corporations to donate incredible amounts of money to um, candidates and to their PACs, which are like loopholes to reach the candidate, but they're not technically the candidate, but they work for the candidate. Um, you know, the, those, those loopholes need to be closed and we need to create a government that is not fueled by the um, corporations anymore. So then the question is, how do you break that, that tie? How do you break that bind between the corporate world and the political world? And that I have tried to do, um, get a lot of friends, <laughs> get more friends than I did because they do not like you poking at that system and they will hurt you and they will stop you at any um, at any, um, by any means necessary. And so I think really building alliances and getting ready and then coming forward, I think that's going to be our biggest win. Lastly, I'll just say sometimes, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. These folks might not change until they just have to, you know, until they hit rock bottom. And that's kind of where we're headed. And it's sad to say, but a lot of these folks will not change until they literally have to. And um, I, I, I know that all of our systems are failing. America hasn't even existed for 300 years and it's already collapsing ecologically, politically, economically. And uh, they're finally starting to look to native people and say, okay, 
maybe we don't have it figured out. Maybe our crops are failing. Maybe we don't know how to feed ourselves. Maybe all of our rivers are poisoned. So sadly, I think sometimes it's not till rock bottom that these people will finally give up their death grip. I, I just want to add, man, um, you know, like this notion of haste, like where does that come from? Like, you know, everyone wants instant change. And I think this is why I kind of really bring in the reconnecting with nature. You talked about indigenous people, like there's a, there's a supreme timing when you connect to nature, which is not always about having things really quickly. And when you're doing systematic change, when you're doing real fundamental change and you connect to nature, your time frame is different. So if someone said something to me about um, an idea that you plant might not even um, bloom or flower in your lifetime. And I think we have to imagine our work in that context as well. And that's why it's so important to that intergenerational passing it on to the young people. You mentioned it earlier about, you know, tending to the forest and stuff. And I think for me personally, you know, like I completely opted out. I was completely anti working with government, completely anti working with corporations, completely working. So literally it was just me, my garden and just grassroots activists just working, doing that. We didn't even engage with anybody like the council. This is our local council municipals in different countries. Only after 14 years and now engaging with us, we, we've been consistent in the borough for 14 years. And how we did that is by connecting to nature get into nature. That's the thing that's really gonna kind of save us right about now. This collapse is happening because we try to drive it economically, gotta do this by A to B to D, to like connect to nature. That's gonna give us so much answers. That's the biggest system. It's the system that's been predating all of us. You talked about an indigenous person right here, the truth, Layla Jew right here. Like she, that her people lived it. My people lived it all across the globe, they lived it. And what's removed us from that is our disconnection from the environment. Get into nature, man. It will just re it will just retrain what's important. Thank you both so much for those really comprehensive, um, cohesive answers. Uh, it made me remember um, something I'm really inspired by this year as well. Something called participatory democracy, which is a very cool movement. Um, I'm not sure how global it is right now, but I've been in touch with the people in the UK and you can check them out, Flat Pack Democracy 2021. Um, and it's about infiltrating political systems at the community level. Um, and whilst in, on one hand, I'm thinking, do you even want a seat at that table? The kind of the, the collective change it can make in order to help imbue community with a sense of agency and get voices um, present that aren't usually present um, I think can be can be really powerful. Uh, Georgie, would you like to ask the next question? Yeah, I think that brings me um, really nicely to um, our next question that was asked to Noga, but um, anyone's welcome to speak after Noga. Um, and that was, can you tell us a bit more about how organizing horizontally at such a big scale works in practice? What school tools do you use to facilitate collective leadership? Um, sure, I guess I'll start us off. So um, I'm not gonna lie, it was really hard. It was very, very difficult. Um, very, very few of us had ever done something like the climate strikes on a national scale, if any of us. And again, almost none of us had been involved in an organization where everyone was at, of equal paramount importance um, and work was delegated in an equal manner as possible. The main obstacles that we came across were that our idea of what looked like leadership and what who we thought was more important and who we thought had more say over things was really incredibly entrenched um, in, you know, is this person in the media? Are they in the public eye? Therefore, they must be a leader. Are they doing press work? Therefore, they must be a leader. Oh, my admin work, my my work of answering emails and speaking in the local community isn't as important, which is, you know, very, very difficult to kind of get ourselves out of the out of that mindset. Um, and it meant that in practice, we very regularly had to come together and remind each other of the work that we were all doing and really break down that work and say, actually, this is immense. We don't get to organizing that kind of demonstration just by having 
someone be a presence in the media. We don't get to that level of demonstration just by having someone who's responsible for bringing the megaphones to every demonstration, who's someone else who is responsible on social media, someone else who's responsible for connecting school teachers in the local community to organize their own strike. These are all people that come together and recognizing that we were um, an organization made up of several equal parts was something we really had to drill into each other and ourselves um, to kind of get out of that very vicious cycle of who is most important, who deserves to be kind of top of this ladder. Um, so we very, very regularly had to re discuss this and we kind of kept ourselves really fluid and flexible about how we would work as an organization. Um, we took it kind of demonstration by demonstration. We couldn't, you know, sit up and say, we're gonna solve the climate crisis. There are so many organizations and people doing that work. Our mission was to organize the climate strikes and we prioritized that strike by strike and that allowed us to um, kind of take a step back after every demonstration, take inventory, look at how successfully we had worked, what work needed to be delegated, was one person or one group of people taking on too much? Did we need to split that up further? Um, how were people feeling and checking in a lot on people's mental health and checking in a lot on people's kind of interpersonal relationships within the organization, um, especially since everyone was under 21 which was kind of a very, you know, and a lot of it was online because it was at a national level. So you are working with, you're like 17, you're working with a 15 year old and a 14 year old, and none of you have ever met each other. And you're from all different corners of the country. Um, and you're trying to organize a small event in a little rural town in a totally separate part of the country that you're completely unaware of. And a lot of that meant really focusing and highlighting the relationships that we had with each other and the connections that we made ensuring that people felt as safe and comfortable as they could so that when um, things went awry, we could actually stop and say, wait, this isn't working. Let's change something slightly. Let's redelegate. Let's um, set up a different group to take that on. Um, let's consider how we can actually re-approach this um, problem and do it differently. Let's talk through our messaging. Let's talk through our communication um, and keeping our communication levels open was really, really important for us. Um, and I'm hoping that that's something we're, we're going to carry on doing. Thank you so much, Noga. Um, it's really inspiring learning more about horizontal organizing. I know it's what um, was kind of behind a lot of the success of the XR movement as well in the UK. Um, we've got a, a question for Salvador uh, from the audience. Um, Caroline Jessel asks, how can you help young people of your generation not to feel despair for the future, which leads to apathy and or denial. Um, what keeps you so positive? And there were a couple questions asking about what keeps you so positive. Well, definitely, um, that's something I know. I noticed too, and, and, and a very many even my friends tell me, how, how do you stay so positive? Um, I think this question ties, ties back a lot to what the first question about how do you not experience burnout? Um, and I think it's part of understanding rather than letting the existential dread of, you know, this, this crisis is severe. It's, it's, it's dangerous. Um, rather than letting that define my mindset, it's more, I'm so excited about so many other young people working alongside me with the same mission. Um, and, and I think it's easy to forget, um, that there are so many other people that have similar goals that stand by stand by us um and that's what keeps me going i, I just get so excited when i see events like this and i have you know my co-panelists we have the audience we have all these other events that really really show our testament to the fact that people really care um and, and the and the people really care not necessarily the people in power but those who drive change the masses care um and, and that's just what keeps me going i, I think understanding that each of us is a small role to play in a much bigger puzzle um, is exciting. I, I'm also just, disclaimer, I, I was born an optimist. Um, so it's very hard um, to just let me, like, let me know. I always try to find that bit of hope, that, that, that light in the darkness, as I could say. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I think it's, it's all about the mindset. 
Thank you so much. Would, it, would any of the other panelists like to speak to that question? Um, otherwise, Georgie will ask the next. Um, I might add to that actually, which is that I, yeah, I really, I think in terms of optimism, like something that makes me really stay hopeful is genuinely like envisioning the better future that we are fighting towards. Like I try to see this work, not just as we want to escape this climate crisis, we want to escape the systems we're trapped in, but also that we are in search of an incredible future we have a vision for it i was just kind of reading through um the seven generations new deal and it looks so incredible and that kind of policy and that kind of vision is so exciting that i genuinely just get so kind of happy and optimistic thinking about the world we dream of and the world we can create and the world i genuinely believe we will get to um and i think that kind of dreaming about that and visualizing it and conceptualizing it and then going to other people and collaborators and colleagues and articulating that together and fighting for it is incredibly powerful and I think that really does kind of keep me going because I am not a natural optimist at all and I have been very very pessimistic about the climate crisis for most of my life but actually kind of landing on these solutions can give great hope and and kind of keep that faith. Thank you. I'd like to share on that if that's okay. Um, and this might be a little controversial, so I apologize in advance, but I'll just I'll just share what some of our creation story says. Um, as as Diné people, aka Navajo, uh, who are indigenous to New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, um, we have a creation story that involves uh, four worlds and the people moving through four different worlds and each of the world worlds each time a world ends the people are forced to evolve or perish and some of the worlds we moved through uh, through a reed um, we had to climb up a reed and get to the next world um, one of the worlds I should mention was destroyed by a flood which is found throughout the world. Um, this idea that the that a flood overcame much of the earth, and so um, I don't think these are just stories. I think they, they actually happened. Um, we do have evidence of Chaco Canyon and the Mayan civilization collapsing, uh, various civilizations collapsing, and what my elders told me is that. At Chaco Canyon, there was a caste system. It's a famous archaeological site. Um, it's a caste system, and it also had a lot of ecological exhaustion. And we were not taking care of the earth. We were not taking care of the women. Um, and unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, you could say, Creator sent us a drought to give us the courage to change. And that drought drove us out of that valley and also at the same time according to one elder the youth rose up <laughs> you know <laughs> and so i just find it fascinating you know that the youth are rising up now um and the youth said we don't want this anymore um and so my nation my people we do not go back to chaco canyon it's a very famous archaeological site people go back all the time uh, or people go all the time and take pictures but we're like no we don't want to go back there been there, done that. We don't want a caste system. We don't want hierarchy. That is what destroyed us from the inside out. And so I guess my point is uh, that, that we have experienced the, the birth and destruction and rebirth of worlds many times before. And so for Diné people, we've actually been prophesizing this for a long time. And we're like, yep, that's about right on time. It's happening, you know? And so, but, but, but the beauty of it is, is that the collapse is the gift in this weird way because from those ashes and i'm not trying to downplay the suffering the suffering is there it's real and it's 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 heartbreaking uh i'm just saying that after that collapse we arise a wiser pe people we arise with so much more understanding of like okay patriarchy doesn't work white supremacy doesn't work uh human supremacy doesn't work 
supremacy in general doesn't work. <laughs> you know? um, uh, short term thinking for the next quarter that doesn't work. Um, acting like we're God and tinkering with genetics and, and trying to manipulate the weather with harp and things that doesn't work. Um, being humble before nature that works honoring women that works, um, really taking the time to see the gifts of all beings that works, you know, diverse polycultures that works, monoculture does not work. And so we are in a, in a very deep and profound learning lesson right now that is really hard, but we're in, a, in this really interesting way, these consequences, just like that drought that came from my people and, and destroyed our civilization that was our gift. Um, and so I guess that's what gives me hope is that hatred just can't stand on land as sacred as this. And it's so exciting that, you know, at a, at a certain point it breaks down and from that, those ashes is reborn a wiser people. And we're already seeing that in many ways. Um, I could go on, but I'll try, I'll try to stop talking there. Thank you so much. Has anyone got anything else they'd like to add to that one? Okay, great. Um, so um, we've had so many questions coming in. I wish that we had um, time to, to answer them all. Um, but one that I'd really like to um, ask is, um, about how um, you've been, you've, I think a number of you have touched on it, how you've been inspired by nature um, in, the create change that you're creating? What lessons have you gained from it? Um, so literally my office is my garden. Like I'm, you know, I was a clubber, I was a raver like 10, 15 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I was having it large, giving it, coming, coming in, you know, like, and actually I just met a gentleman who just literally just showed me the power of nature. And I just think, you know, like I'm a person that's only experienced this and I've managed to transform myself, my environment and other people to become all the things that was talked about earlier. You know, you're talking about the biodiversity, all these things that are in nature, they're nature's principles. They're not man-made principles. As, as um, Lila was saying earlier, all these things are isms. Nature doesn't deal with isms, it deals with humanity. It deals with a global humanity, a universal uh, system. So for me, immerse yourself in it as much as you can. And I don't mean that in a kind of, you know, like a kind of like, oh, we are the, like, immerse yourself. That means getting out in the ring. That means like, for me at the moment, like going into the water, cold water bathing when it's freezing cold because nature, is, is both sides of the equation. Everyone likes the sunshine, no one likes winter time. Do you know what I mean? But if we truly want to become spiritual beings or we want to come more understanding of nature, we have to embrace the duality that is the, the, the magnitude of possibility that it shows us. As someone was talking about in a chat about, you know, trying to select what we want from nature. That's my mate. This is not this is not what nature's about. We have to really embrace it in its entirety. And I've only been doing this 15 years and it's transformed me and people around me. Imagine as we were talking about indigenous people globally, you know, this was the existence for thousands of thousands. That's what I had to disconnect these people. I totally agree with what you're saying about this time. This this is this is not nothing new. Our ancestors knew all about this stuff. And that's why we live in city environments now. We live in a nice, comfortable electricity. How many of us can grow food? How many of us can cook, cook our own food? How many can plant food? Who can live off the grid without electricity for free? Not many of us, because we're dependent. So really, we have to really question our Western way of living in this society and how we can reduce our impact to really, you know, make a difference. You know, that's personally for me, yeah. I just want to tack on one quick little thing. Uh, one of my elders, I'm always quoting my elders because they're so interesting. Um, but they said, the reason the seasons are shifting is because we're eating strawberries in the winter and we're eating winter greens in the summer. And they're saying, uh, the seasons are like, okay, well, I guess you don't need us anymore. We're gonna go now. And that's sort of how um, a lot of indigenous thinking is. It doesn't seem like logical from a Western scientific view, but it kind of makes sense like we're taking the seat and like 
uh, my dear friend here was saying, we, we want the summer, but not the winter. We're not really embracing all the facets that creator gave us to experience here. Uh, and so one of the elders was like, yeah, that's why the seasons are going away. Thank you both so much. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, you've all spoken so eloquently and articulately and inspiringly, um, and it can make um, us feel sometimes that that you know you don't have feelings of inadequacy or, or, or failure. And, and I love this question. Um, it says. Uh, there's been, uh, people have ad addressed fears of inadequacy and, and failure. Um, can you share any feelings or thoughts on working with the discomfort um, that many feel in the face of unrelenting, unrelenting uncertainty um, and chaos? Um, Noga or, or Salvador, I don't know if you'd like to start off that one, um, but all panelists are so welcome to, to speak yeah, to it. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I have a very particular memory of last, summer the summer of 2019 and I was um like you know getting ready to go to bed and then I just I just started crying I just genuinely burst into tears and I'd I'd spent all day um working on kind of organizing the September strike and just going back and forth to a bunch of different places and events and kind of calling people and on long zoom calls and meetings and emails and it was just such a long day and I just got into bed exhausted and just started crying and remember my dad had to come upstairs and um, he was like what's going on and I turned around and I said to him you know what if this doesn't work like what if we put in all this effort and all this time and we organize these demonstrations and what if no one turns up and it's all been for nothing? Or what if actually loads of people turn up and then nothing happens and we totally fail? And, you know, there's, uh, there's obviously very little he could say to comfort me, you know, what's he gonna do? He's not gonna solve the crisis there and then. But I just remember that moment very specifically because for me, it was a real moment where I said to myself, okay, actually, you know, we're not going to be able to do this in a, in a day. People haven't been able to do this in 40 years. This is a lot of work and it is a lot of time. And actually it's okay to sit and cry about it. This is a terrifying thing. Like if we, we do of course have to take our time with the work we're doing, but we also need to get out of this situation as fast as we can. There, there is, you know, this impending um, continuation of catastrophes coming and the more we can avoid the better and the, the fact that like, you know, the idea that we couldn't avoid many kind of oncoming disasters was a terrifying thing. And I do often kind of think of that night and I do often think, you know, this year has been slow because of COVID and I don't know how next year will be, but the more people that join the movement, the closer we are to getting there. And we're not gonna see results straight away. We're not gonna see um, leaders acting straight away, but we will, have one day amassed enough people for it to be necessary for those in power to change. Um, I think, as others were saying earlier, you know, they will act when they're forced to, and that's our job. And I think eventually we can force them. And that kind of kept me going that night. I, I think that was fantastic, Noga. Um, and, I, and I think this question ties into two things. One is imposter syndrome. Um, and that's, I hear that in my circles a lot. Uh, and then there's, you know, the permission to feel. Um, and I have to, I have to, I have to say that, ter that term, I did not coin that term. That term was coined by Dr. Mark Brackett. He's the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. It's the title of his most recent book. Um, but I'll touch on these two things. The first is imposter syndrome. Um, it's really easy to feel like Noah was saying, like, oh my God, what if what I'm doing is for nothing? And what if I'm not the person to do this? I think that's a question that goes in a lot of our minds. If, if we want to make a change, it's we question ourselves, we question our position and our role within that. Um, but I always ask myself this question, if not me, then who? Right? If, if, we, if we keep on deferring responsibility, that's how we got here in the first place, right? Because people deferred responsibility. Um, and I think we just really have to embrace this moment and say, you know, 
I'm, I'm alive right now. I have somewhat of a role I can play. So I'm just going to go ahead and play it. And if it doesn't pan out, then think about what else um, you could have learned from it. In, in Noga's case, you know, she was worried about what if the, the strikes don't pan out? What if no one shows up? Well, yes, ideally you want people to show up, but if they don't, then you learned a lot of valuable lessons about organizing, tangible lessons, but also lessons about yourself, about how can I make myself better? In my case, I dealt with impossible syndrome and doubting my results with light and hope all the time. There was a whole moment for two months where the fundraising total was stuck at $60,000 and it was not moving, not moving at all. And I was, I, and I, I was pretty certain that that was the end, that I didn't reach my goal. And I was prepared to just say, you know what, I, I guess, this is how fate deems it, but I've learned so much in the process. And right as I was beginning to just accept that, that's when the kind of the fundraising spiked again. Um, but I think we have to be comfortable with accepting that not everything is in our control. Um, and being com and, and I know it's easier, it's easier said than done, you know, say being comfortable, feel at ease with your emotions. Um, but I think a lot of the pressure comes from external sources. We, we want to please so many people. We want to, to get these external results that we often forget to think about how we feel in our role uh, internally. So I think that just giving ourselves that quote, permission to feel and, and, and understanding that even if we might not be the perfect people to, to, to assume a role, we are the ones who have, are in the position to assume a role, I think we'll be in much better shape and, and we'll be much more comfortable with, with what we do. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I feel like we're going to have to um, move into our one minute summaries from everyone. Um, I just wanted to say I, I love this, um, the notion of non-attachment, which seems to be coming up um, through all of you in, in different ways. Um, and I think it's a really powerful um, it's really powerful to have it in mind, but also to remember that non-attachment is a practice like we're, we're not we, 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 aren't, we aren't brought up to kind of understand what true non-attachment is in action. Um, and I remember being very nervous before introducing someone at an event um, and told the person I was nervous and they reminded me that it wasn't about me um, and that I was doing it in service. And then immediately um, I remembered that it's not, and it's not about whether or not I'm going to look like an idiot or um, I'm going to mess up, but I'm here in service. So that really helped. Um, so I think we're going to work backwards to how we did before. Um, so we'd love to hear kind of one minute takeaway messaging. Sorry, takeaway message summarizing your thoughts on good leadership. Um, and Noga, we'll start with you, please. Um, I think for me, you know, a safer, more equitable future can only come about when we build solidarity and community across borders. That must be the aim of great leaders. That is what um you know that is what your mind should be focused on and you can't in that process leave anyone behind when we organize for that better future especially as we fight against a pandemic anything that we do now as leaders in the longer term recovery or immediately has to be with the aim of ending global injustices of conflict of environmental degradation and of guaranteeing human rights and free movement for all from kind of local communities to the world stage leadership is about organizing to share solutions to share technology to transfer finance and redistribute wealth where it's needed and only then can we actually achieve climate justice thank you and salvador so I, I think I'd, I'd urge all of you to remember that change making is about mobilizing empathy into action, right? It's, it's about accepting our feelings and using that as a fuel for positive change. And it might be challenging to overcome that first step of, you know, how, then how do I channel it? What do I do? How can I do something? Um, but find something that aligns with your values. And like I mentioned, if you haven't made a personal value statement, I urge you to do one um, and make one. And it, it can be very brief or it can be very long. I mean, I've seen personal value statements my friends is like two pages long. Mine is two sentences, but it really, it just has to embody how you think and, and, and who you want to be. Um, leadership is also not about what the actions one takes, but about how one inspires and empowers others. And having those unyielding values is what will allow you to make a meaningful impact on our world. So brace on. Thank you, KMT and then Lila. Um yeah leadership i just really feel that um it's it's really about just recognizing that we all are leaders 
like we all our leaders you know like this whole thing we talked about what is leadership like looking at us as the people with the answers like i think we've all been through many different stages to come to those answers you know i remember doing a talk in mexico when someone asked me well you know how comes you've got to this certain stage of you know being quite a successful artist and i said well i've been through all the things that you're going to go through to get to this point and i think we really need to recognize that leadership comes in many different forms many different types and actually it's a journey it's not just a one you know that's it one solution you've got the answer it's very much a journey as well a journey of discovery a journey of pain a journey of beauty a journey of hate a, a journey of sabotage you know this is all part of the journey of leadership as well this notion that it's kind of like we're going to walk together as leaderships and just you know nice and happy sunshine that's part of it but as i said before where there's sunshine you must have rain so that's what i'll just say in terms of leadership Thank you so much, all three of you. It's really been an honor to, to work with you. Um, I, I would just say a little, I'll just end with a little story. Um, one time, my Diné uh, grandfather, by clan, not biologically, but by clan, he said, whenever you go to a new land, Lila, make sure you follow the ceremony of that land follow the people of that land because their language, their ceremony has co-evolved with that, with that environment and that specific ecosystem for thousands of years. And so if you go to Washington state where the salmon flow, follow the people of the salmon. If you go to Maine where they have aquaculture and they take care of all of the aquatic animals uh, on, the, on the seaboard, follow the way of, of, of those people. And so I think it is a, a, an incumbent on us all to, to really follow the leadership of the local peoples and those who still retain the traditional ecological knowledge of that place. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and on behalf of the Resurgence Trust, Eco Resolution, and everyone gathered here today, I'd like to offer our heartfelt thanks to today's remarkable panelists, No Glevy Rappaport, Lila June Johnson, KMT Freedom Teacher, and Salvador Gomez Colon. <laughs> and thank you to all of you, our audience, for joining us today. I'm so glad that we could all come together to explore this incredibly important topic. And I'm really excited about the ripple effects that I hope will come out of today's discussion. Um, I also really can't wait to gather at future events to delve into this topic and the skills that needed to be more effective change makers. We'll email you to let you know about the events that emerge out of um, today and um, your feedback and really hope that you can continue this journey with us. If you did not sign up to receive updates when registering for this discussion, but would like to know about our future Changemaker events, please email events at resurgence.org so that you can be added to the list. Um, the event will, the address will be posted in the chat now, and um, we'll be taking all of your feedbacks and your comments in the chat, and we will circulate that in our team and um, look at all of that after this event. So thank you. Thanks, Georgie, and thank you to the Resurgence Trust um, and to all the brilliant panelists. Um, I really recommend everyone um, finding out their different websites and, and, and different pages so you can see how you can support their work further because um, they're all up to amazing things. Um, and you can check out Eco Resolution through our website, or we do an interactive social media learning journey where we like unpack a different topic each month. Um, we are doing a screening of the Condor and the Eagle um, with Cara and some incredible frontline Indigenous activists in, actually we're going to confirm the date this week, um, but that's coming soon. And yeah, we've got something called the, the Changemaker Network, which is a global community of around 60 change makers um, and we meet once a month to share ideas and we watch documentaries and we chat about them and we kind of seek advice we seek mentorship um, and we just learn together um, so yes yeah, so you can find out all about that on either the instagram or the website ecoresolution.earth um, so yeah thank you all so much thank you christabel um,
and so that's it for now we will send you links about um, our future events and videos that we have to share and about our publications the ecologist um, and our magazine resurgence and ecologist sign up to the ecologist if you want daily weekly or monthly up environmental news updates um, but for now thank you again to all of the panelists it's been such an inspiring night i'm just so grateful to all of you and thank you to everyone who's attended. I really hope that this gathering will fuel our activism, our collective purpose, and provide us with strength, skills, and courage as we strive to bring about environmental justice. Thank you and good night. <laughs>